So we are moving on, and we have a final uh, talk, a um, short talk by Dr. Velko Dublivik, who is a neuroethicist and a postdoctoral fellow at the unit which I lead here at IRCM. Um, you'll understand very quickly why I recruited him as a postdoctoral <coughs> fellow. First of all, he's an emerging star in the field of neuroethics. But second, he did actually two PhDs. He did one first at the University of Belgrade in political theory. And then uh, he got really interested by the impact of neuroscience on ethics. So he did another PhD at the University of Tübingen, which is well, very well known for its um, uh, contributions to the history of philosophy. And then he joined us uh, uh, a year ago uh, already. His uh, primary interests include uh, the ethics of neuroscience and technology and the neuroscience of ethics. His other interests include bioethics, political theory, moral theory, business ethics, and philosophy of law. He has already published extensively in these areas and is involved in some of our uh, leading uh, societies, such as the International Neuroethics Society, and served as a member for the communications uh, arm of that society. And locally here in Montreal, he serves as the executive director of the Montreal Neuroethics ne Network, which organizes a series of events and seminars on topics uh, such as tonight's topic. So if ever you're interested in learning more about these, uh, these subjects, Belko is the person to go to to know more uh, about this. So Belko, thanks for joining us and for actually having the initial idea of putting a Cafe Science on this topic. So, well, thank you for having me. To add, uh, Tübingen in Germany is famous also for its neuroscience and neurology. So I took the advantage of uh, learning both at the right place. So to, to cut the long story short, uh, why am I here? I, I'm here to present neuroethics as the discipline. And neuroethics is both neuro and both ethics. So it's very important to be very, well, knowledgeable about both neuroscience. And that's what I did. I did some training in neuroscience in Tübingen. And to be knowledgeable about your philosophy and your ethics, and to be critical towards both, because there are misconceptions from both sides. So ideally, a neuroethicist should be able to navigate the waters of neuroscience and neurology on the one hand, and philosophy and ethics on the other hand. That is ideal. And the neuroethicist should be critical and criticize uh, methodological inconsistencies in both. So, come back to the challenge, whether neuroscience will be, uh, you know, like revolutionizing what we do or, or not, or is it the same old, same old. I'm going to, of course, opt for the third view, that there will be some gradual change, and I will explain why. But first, let's see what is the challenge, because uh, even though we've heard a very, very good rendition of what neuroscience is, uh, going to offer us as new insights and new knowledge, uh, uh, there have been people who have interpreted these results in varying drastic claims. So some claim that neuroscientific findings, and we'll come back to that, are going to totally change the way we are viewing ourselves, the way we ascribe moral responsibility. And the reason why they think so is because they claim that neuroscientific data has proven a certain metaphysical position, and that is the metaphysical position of hard determinism. Some others claim that actually, you know, free will is an illusion, but it's an important illusion because, you know, we ascribe responsibility based on free will, so we might want to keep it, right? Others claim that we need to reform the legal system because there is no free will, hence we should kind of use different concepts instead of free will to punish criminals. Instead of punishing criminals, we, can, we should just detain them because they are a threat to society, and so on and so forth. There is a, a, a growing uh, uh, research of coming from the behavioral side, from social psychology and cognitive psychology, in the so-called priming studies, in which people have been uh, given short texts that are priming them to believe in determinism, 
and then they have more excuses and they cheat more in exams and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of lot of problems and we need to kind of see where we at. So this is the experiment. And as I when I said that we're critical, we're critical to our both. And this is a very important experiment, but what is important to see is from uh, 83, it's an EEG study, that it gives us information that there are uh, there is brain activity before we make a decision. So this is an empirical fact. And neuros neuroethics is a branch of ethics that is scientific. So it's an ethics of science, neuroscience, but it's also using scientific data to promote ethical reflection. So we need to take that really seriously. However, this is the experiment uh, as, was, as was done by Lebet in 83. So, we had the measurement of the brain activity, that's EEG, and we had the measurement of when the movement was made. So the first awareness of the intention to move was uh, basically later. We had brain activity before that. And people have, uh, have basically interpreted these results in different ways. So Lebet himself, he reached a compatibilist uh, conclusion. He said, okay, sure, this is changing the way we think about free will. He was using these words, but there is something called the veto power. So we can still stop certain actions or if we plan certain actions, that is okay. Other neuroscientists, however, like Hegel, who was mentioned, are reaching drastically different conclusions, which are hard, uh, in line with hard determinism. Hager uses the same data, the same that Libet had, and reaches, with his added metaphysical assumptions, a metaphysical conclusion. So, in effect, what they're doing was metaphysics, not neuroscience at all. The point being, what do we care when we, what do we care about when we're talking about free will? We're usually talking about free will. Well, we care about autonomy, and we care about ascription of moral responsibility. So autonomy is one of the most basic and most important principles that lead our ethical discussion. And people frequently link autonomy with free will. But the point being, we don't need free will. And this is the change that actually neuroscience is bringing and that needs to be criticized within neuroscience. We don't need free will as a metaphysical concept because we have plenty, we have self-control. We used to think of different options to explain when people are responsible or when they're not responsible by the concepts we had used at the time. So, in ancient times, we thought that entities which had souls have free will and hence are morally responsible. That led to different, very, uh, very bizarre events, such as uh, punishing children because they have souls, therefore they have free will, and therefore they are hung if they steal things. Nowadays, we're more scientific. So we see that there's self-control. So self-control is a capacity that evolves. Self-control is a capacity that can be diminished. And self-control is a capacity that we presuppose every adult has. So in my work, including my published work, I have, and this is my, uh, my view of the things. Some people might disagree. I'm, I'm hoping that Professor Weinstock will disagree with me and we'll have a nice discussion. <laughs> my point is that we don't need free will at all. This is a metaphysical concept. And all the neuroscientists that have been making these claims have been dabbling in metaphysics. What we need to do is take a look at the data. And the data is that there is plenty of physical evidence that we do have self-control barring certain pathologies. So, is autonomy, and I'm uh, 
if, if you remember, I never in my uh, my presentation, I, in the title of my part of the presentation, I didn't say free will. I'm, I'm talking about autonomy because this is what is important. I'm talking about moral responsibility because this is what is important. Free will is a metaphysical construct. Children have autonomy or they have more and more self-control. If we reach back to the old uh, dualistic kind of uh, mind frame, we would think that after reaching age 18, poof, instantly we grow a free will to our soul, which we didn't have before that. But this is not true, this is not scientific. Of course, neuroscience and cognitive science should inform our view of moral responsibility. We cannot apply responsibility where this responsibility cannot be uh, expected. So we can expect a certain amount of responsibility from children, much more from adults, but if the brain region for self-control is damaged, then we can have uh, diminished responsibility. And this is the take-home message. So we don't need free will, all we need is autonomy. And basic autonomy is something that we presuppose. If you're an adult, you're, uh, you're autonomous. If, as in the experiment, you decided to, to raise your arm, barring someone else coming and forcing you, like coercion, you had full liberty to do that. So, my proposition is, instead of talking about free will, let's talk about liberty. Liberty defined in absence of coercion or compulsion. So, nobody coerced you to raise your hand. There was, there was no invisible strings moving your hand, you raised your hand by yourself. Nobody diminished your self-control in doing that. Therefore, you are responsible for that. Fortunately, there was no, uh, no major incident involved, so there is no imputed blame. But we all always presuppose that you are responsible unless we have good reasons why you're not responsible. So autonomy, historically, has been related to an ideal that we only always think through a lot of stuff. And this is an ideal. Children usually don't think through a lot of stuff that they do. Some of the adults, or most of the adults, don't do it as well. But again, this is an ideal. What we have as a capacity that is underlying all that is self-control. We can increase our self-control and neuroscientific studies and social psychology and cognitive science studies all point to the conclusion that we do have self-control. And this is something that can be increased. And that as a basis for ascribing responsibility for neuroethics or for my uh, proposal in neuroethics, which is political and not metaphysical, suffices. We have the empirical fact of ascribing responsibility we will continue to do that, and we will always find very good results, or very good reasons, sorry, to say when a person, uh, we can think of the example of Phineas Gage who had a gaping hole in his frontal vortex, when a person can be excused, because we should move on, and this is the, I would say, the take of my message of neuroethics, move on from ancient concepts such as free will or other metaphysical concepts and use more scientific concepts such as self-control and autonomy. And with this, I would like to thank all the members of the research, uh, Neuroethics Research Unit and thank you for the attention. So, uh, excuse me, uh, les propos, uh, en deux, trois mots. Essentiellement, à la fois les, les neurosciences et la, la tradition en éthique euh, ont utilisé le concept de libre arbitre ou free will. Mais ce que Velko nous invite à faire, c'est de remplacer ce terme-là, qui, qui est problématique, qui laisse supposer beaucoup de choses, par un concept plus modeste d'autonomie ou de contrôle de soi, qui sont euh, suffisants pour euh, assurer euh, qu'on soit capable de s'attribuer la responsabilité de nos gestes en société. On n'a pas besoin de euh, s'embarquer dans des débats qu'on dit métaphysiques, c'est-à-dire très élaborés, très hautement conceptuels, et plutôt le, les ramener à un niveau plus pratique. Donc, voilà un, un court résumé.
Euh, ce qu'on va faire en ce moment, c'est euh, prendre une pause d'une dizaine de minutes.